Father, we thank you for who you are and what you've done for each one of us. Lord, while we share our goodness, Ming and I, we also know you have been good to everyone. And that if everyone were to be able to share how you have been to them, they too will testify of the faithfulness of a God who walks with his people and do not leave us and abandon us. So we thank you, praise you. Lord, today, as this is Palm Sunday, Lord, help us to just come to the place of uh, recognizing the presence of God in our midst. We thank you in Jesus' name we pray. Okay, Palm Sunday. We did Palm Sunday about a few weeks ago, and I won't go through the detail of it, but I've brought up certain things. I've said that welcoming the King, hosting the Divine Presence. See, when Jesus went into uh, uh, Jerusalem, uh, as the scripture says, uh, in welcoming the king, there was a prophecy way back in Psalms 118. It was Jesus was coming in as the king, the Messiah, coming to J uh, Jerusalem as prophesied. Okay? Uh, as the scripture says in Matthew, it says, uh, all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So Jesus was coming into Jerusalem from Mount of Olives, going to go through the East Gate. Okay? The East Gate has many prophetic references, which I'll share with you like, as we go on. Nah? And as he went in, okay, it was to fulfill the prophecy. I spoke to you a, a, a few weeks back about what is one of God's intention. His intention was to dwell with His people. That's why in the Garden of Eden, God came down and fellowship with the people. Then in the time of uh, uh, the Exodus, uh, the tent of meeting or the tabernacle of the Lord, tent of meeting, uh, was created so that God may come down and meet with the people. But at the time, he only met through Moses. Because at Mount Sinai, when the Lord says, I want to be your God, and you're going to be my people, the people who were so frightened because of the fire, the smoke, everything, they told Moses, you speak to God, and, you, you, and, then, and then the Lord speak to you, to us. They were afraid of that uh, presence of God because he was an awesome God. And rightfully, because God is an awesome God, and any sin... Uh, the, uh, in His holiness will be utterly destroyed. So we may think to ourselves today, how privileged we are. Yes, when God reveals Himself in His holiness, any sin will be destroyed completely. That's why then the tabernacle and all the rituals as to how people may approach God. But God wants to dwell with His people. That's why He came and uh, instructed on the building of the ark. After the second uh, uh, temple was built, after the first one was destroyed because of people's disobedience, the second temple was built and uh, the ark has disappeared. They could never find the ark. So it was just a building and the ark was not there. The rituals were going on, but the presence of God was not there. When I come to the New Testament, Jesus came, the Messiah, and he is the ark of the covenant. The ark was coming. And, uh, and we know in, when he was stepping to Jerusalem, what happened was that if they had received him and uh, the temple had been cleansed, then revelation was fulfilled. The God will dwell among his people. There will no longer be any pain, suffering kind of thing. But we know they did not. So this is the first time. Your king is coming to you. Not in the way they expected, not like on a white horse, but on the colt, a donkey, speaking to us of the first time when he comes, humility. He's coming as a king to rule over our heart. And we know, of course, that uh, he was welcomed by the ordinary people, particularly those coming from Galilee with him, uh, because this multitude accompanied him, spread their clothes on the road, uh, we were thinking whether we want to put some palm on the sun, uh, for this Sunday, but we decided, yeah, pastor not here. And then after that, don't know what they do, how they get it going. Uh, then we're going to get rid of it later. Let's not do too many things. But imagine there were palms lining up, okay? Spread your clothes on the road. Every one of you take your clothes out, put it on the floor, okay? 
They cut down branches from the tree, spread them on the road. The multitudes that were going before Jesus as they were coming to Jerusalem, and the multitudes that were following, they all cried out, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Remember the phrase? Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The Messiah is coming in the name of the Lord. They were expecting the Messiah to come. And here was the group of people welcoming him. But of course, he was rejected by the rulers of Israel. And remember what the prophetic word says. Huh? When Jesus looked at Jerusalem, he said, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who often kills the prophets and stone those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your, chicks, your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The multitude that went in, Blessed is he who came in the, in the name of the Lord. But the rulers and the people in Jerusalem, the city down south in Judah, not the Galileans, they rejected him. So the Lord said, your house is left to you desolate. We know after that, Jesus prophesied about the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. AD 70, Jerusalem was completely destroyed. The temple was completely removed and it fell into the hands of the Roman who changed the whole name of Israel because of, the, of this difficult uh, people, Israel, and changed it to Palestine. You understand today's story about where did the Palestinian come from? The Romans changed it to Palestine, to the land of, the, of Palestine. And Jerusalem was given a different name. Over the years, you know, Israel was scattered throughout, the Jews were scattered out throughout the world. And uh, so, until they say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, uh, they will still be scattered. But the grace of God in 1948, uh, Israel became a nation again, but still not yet a nation under God. They are very secular and they are very anti Christians. Because the Orthodox uh, priests uh, uh, will say, We don't recognize Jesus as a Messiah. They hate us, Jews, Orthodox Jews. So, Christians, when we go on our tour there, uh, they, they don't like us, but they like our money and uh, <laughs> kind of thing. Huh? So, rejection. Now, Paul amazingly prophesied uh, in Romans. He says, I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion. The blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come. In other words, in God's timetable, the gospel is to go to the whole world. There will come a time when the gospel has been preached to all. The fullness of the Gentiles has come. Then the blindness in Israel's life will be removed. And then so all Israel will be saved. In our, in our generation, depending on the time frame, Israel as a nation will come back to God. But before that, they will suffer a lot of things. There's the Ezekiel 37, Gog and Magog war. You know, there's going to be an invasion by the uh, Muslim nation uh, with, Israel, uh, with Russia uh, to, into the West Bank, which is the center of, uh, which today is a center of strife. So, so all Israel will be saved, as it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion. He will turn away ungodliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. God's going to take away their sins. That's Romans. Paul talked about it. Let's look at the Old Testament and see what Zechariah records. Huh? It says it will be fulfilled in Israel in the last days. It says, I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me whom they pierced. Right now, they don't recognize Jesus. What is this crucified Christ? He's not our uh, Christ. But there will come that day, they will look on Jesus whom they pierce, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one who grieves for a firstborn. That will be the day of Israel coming back. And if we read Romans uh, later on, it will also lead to the resurrection of the dead, okay? Coming of Christ, uh, the resurrection of the dead. Yeah? 
So when the Messiah comes back, Zechariah has much more to say, which I didn't put down here. Um, Zechariah talks about he will come and land on Mount of Olives. There'll be an earthquake. Mount of Olives will split. You know, the north and south a valley will come out. Uh, uh, there will be a valley. And from the east gate, you know, from the temple will flow waters that goes out one side to the Dead Sea, and the Dead Sea will become alive again. The other, the other side will flow into, into the Mediterranean, and the Lord will enter through the East Gate. But Ezekiel said the same thing. Now, Ezekiel had many prophecies, but when it came to the prophecy concerning the rebuilding of the temple, it's the rebuilding of the t- temple. Okay, and after giving all the instructions, it's a very tedious thing to read. Nah? The measurement here, there, you know, the gate here and there. Very difficult, but at the end of the temple being re- rebuilt, uh, he says this. Afterwards he, brought, afterwards, he brought me to the gate, the gate that faces towards the east, the east gate of the wall that faces Mount Olives. We were all there, those who were with us, standing there on Mount of Olives, looking across, and then there were cemeteries between the East Gate and Mount of Olives. The reason there were cemeteries is that there's a tradition that when the Messiah comes into that gate, uh, the dead will rise first. So all the Jewish people will, uh, they're waiting for the Messiah. They, they bury there. It's very expensive land, right? Yeah, Muslims are so. Okay. The gate that faces towards the east, and behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east, landing on Mount Zion. Uh, uh, Mount Olives, and his voice was like the sound of many waters, and the earth shone with his glory. That's the end. We were singing in a song, the weight of his glory descend on us. And uh, we have never seen, experienced what's the glory of God like. You know, when they, when they erected the tabernacle in Exodus, after they did everything according to Moses, the tabernacle or the tent of meeting, Do you know when they consecrated in the presence of God fell on that place and there was a cloud, okay? In the daytime, it looks like a fire. In the nighttime, it looks, uh, no, in the daytime, it looks like a cloud. In the nighttime, it's like a fire. And the glory of God was with the people. And whenever the people moved through the uh, wilderness, it was because that glory, the Ark of the Covenant moved. Then they only moved. That tells us how important it is to have the glory of God in our midst to know what are the things we ought to do. Huh? Okay? Now, Ezekiel continued to say, And the glory of the Lord came into the temple by the way of the gate which faces towards the east. And the Spirit... Ezekiel experienced a few times what we call uh, spirit transportation. You know, he was transported from Babylon, uh, from a river there, shoop, he was in Jerusalem. So one day, we'll probably be able to move like that. Uh. And the Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. When Solomon built the first temple, we all know, right? The glory of God filled that temple, and the priests could not even stand to worship. I want us to see where I'm leading on to the glory of God how to host the divine presence we welcome the king into our life we have all welcomed the king we welcome the king into a church but how do we host the presence of god in the old testament you have no such privilege you come in bearing any sin listed you dead you will be dead but in the new covenant is different but still there is a procedure by which we may come into the house of the Lord. Now this is the eastern uh, gate, huh? right? You see behind there, Rock of the Dome? That's where all the, around this period of time, expect a lot of uh, trouble in the Temple Mount, okay? The Muslims celebrate the Hari Raya on the same place, Al-Aqsa Mosque, Ro- Rock of the Dome, and uh, the Jewish people celebrate their Passover. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a big mess. <laughs> so that's, that's it. Now you can, see the, you can see the two doors sealed up, right? Right? And uh, do you know that Ezekiel prophesied that this door will be sealed? After he talked about coming into the east gate, now Ezekiel said this, huh? Then the man, that's the angel, brought me back to the east gateway in the outer wall of the temple area, but it was closed. And the Lord said to me, this gate must remain closed. 
it will never again be opened at that time. No one will open it and pass through it, for the Lord, the God of Israel, has entered here. Therefore, it must always remain shut. Only the prince, the Messiah, the Messiah is always called the prince in the Old Testament as well. Only the prince himself may sit inside this gateway to feast in the Lord's presence, but he may come and go only through the entry room of the gateway. You know who sealed this temple, the gate? Eastern Gate was sealed shut in AD 1540 and 41 during the Ottoman Empire. The uh, Ottoman Empire took over vast areas in the world, became one of the largest empires. Constantinople, which used to be the capital of the Byzantium Empire, which is the East Roman Catholic Church, East Eastern Church, the Western had already collapsed. The barbarians, the Huns from, uh, from Germany had overtaken, left only the Eastern Byzantium Empire, and they were holding out, and the capital was Constantinople. But the same emperor, uh, Suleiman, was able to take Constantinople. Today it's called Istanbul. Istanbul. Now just a little bit ahead, uh, we may, if the Lord's willing, be taking a tour from Turkey and Greece and we'll be at Istanbul as well. So we hope to tell a lot more stories about the move of God through Paul as well as subsequent history. Yeah? It was closed by order of Suleiman the Magnificent, who was the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. And it is believed that the reason for the closing of the Eastern Gate was to prevent the Jewish Messiah from gaining entrance to Jerusalem. They knew the prophecies, huh? so they want to just prevent him from coming in. And the Bible states that the Messiah will pass through the Eastern Gate when he comes to rule. The Muslim Suleiman was attempting to thwart the Messiah's plan with 16 feet of cement. You think that's an obstacle? No. And up to now, the Eastern Gate has remained sealed. All right? But when the Lord comes, the earthquake is going to crack that right open. Whatever that will happen, we don't know. And He will be able to enter. Yeah. 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 So we look at the Jews. It was intentional by God that their eyes were blinded. So that when they re uh, reject the Messiah, the gospel goes out to the end of the earth, to the Gentiles, and the church was birthed. And it was in God's plan that the church was his original purpose. He chose, he chose the, uh, Abraham and the nation of Israel so that the good news may go, uh, go out through them, but they failed God, and then it was now over to the Messiah and his church of Jesus Christ. You can see that we become the church of God in a church not just because we are going to go to heaven. That's the purpose that we live for, the preaching of the gospel to the ends of this earth. It's not just for ourselves, not just, oh God, may you heal our hurts here, heal my wounds here, my problem. Yes, we all do need healing, but we need to rise up beyond ourselves like i think paul and jo uh, john and paula sanford in this inner healing says we will always be wounded healers in other words while we still have wounds we minister if you're waiting for the time where you have don't have wounds and any hurt then you want to minister it may never never happen <laughs> okay now i want to talk about hosting the presence of god from the old testament leading to the New Testament so that it might guide us on what we want to do. First of, all, I, first of all, I want to take you through the example of Abraham. And I want you to no I will note that when the Lord visits, this is the visitation of God, Jesus said to the Jerusalem, He said, you did not know the visitation of the Lord. When the Lord visits, it's always for a purpose. When the Lord visits Abraham, when he was sitting in front of the, uh, uh, the tent. Uh, let me maybe move forward so you can see. Uh, the Lord appeared, visited him in the New King James, uh, uh, appeared to him by the terebinth trees of memory as he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. The previous chapter, God had renewed his covenant and told him very clearly 
that the son of promise is not Ishmael, even though he says, Lord, let Ishmael inherit the promises. The Lord says, no, it will be through the wife, your wife, Sarah. So when the Lord visited, there were two full purposes. Huh? There were three of them coming. One reason was that he, they may speak clearly in the hearing of Sarah that she is to bear a son that's going to be the son of promise. We all know that story. We've done that in our life of Abraham. How Sarah laughed and said, yeah, can I in my old age still have a child? You know, and the Lord rebuked her in that sense and says, is anything too hard for the Lord? Okay? But the second purpose when God visited Abraham was that when he had spoken to Abraham, after that, two of the angels went down to Sodom to judge that city. When the Lord visits his people, he gives us an opportunity to be involved in the salvation of others. His goal was to go and destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because the cry of the people have come up. Wickedness. People have been, have been uh, uh, sort of like uh, suffering and the voice come up and God says, I'm going to judge them. And so after the two angels went, the Lord deliberately stayed with Abraham and allowed him to negotiate. What if there are 50 people, will you still destroy the city? It's not like you to destroy the righteous together with the uh, ungodly, 50 to 40 to 30 and down on to finally. Abraham settled for 10. He didn't go further. He said, Lord, this is the final time. If you can find 10, will you save the city? Will you still destroy? And the Lord said, I will not. But he couldn't find them. And then after that, the angels went. And Lot and his family were taken out, right? He still saved the righteous, but the city was judged. You know, if when the Lord had come into Jerusalem, the Messiah had come, and if he had cleansed the temple and he had become a house of prayer for all the nation, you see, the, the goal is that then would salvation come to the rest of the nation. But they did not. But I want, to look at, uh, I want you to look at how Abraham hosted when God visits us. When God visits you in your life personally, when you become a believer, you welcome the king in. How do you host the presence of God inside? How do we as a church host the presence of God? He lifted up his eyes. One of the things that we do in worship, we lift up our hands and we lift up our eyes. It's not that we open up and see more than the ceiling <laughs> and see some supernatural thing. Lifting up of eyes speak to us that we're looking into the heaven, into the realm of God, and God may give us vision, God may give us revelation. Lift up our eyes, and he saw three men standing by him, and when he saw them, he knew straight away the Lord was visiting. It was quite clear. Because he ran from the tent door to meet them, he bowed himself to the ground. Forms of worship, prostrate. So, when God comes into our into our vis visit us during a time of worship, let's feel free to respond in kind. If you feel you want to kneel down, please do so. We need to know how to host the presence of God. Okay, and um, the pen the charismatic only know how to cry, cry, cry. That's all we do it. We scream our head up and cry and cry. But that's not the only way to respond to the presence of God. It could be some people fall and prostrate themselves in the presence of God because they sense the presence. There are so many different ways of uh, worship. He bowed down to the ground. The next thing he says to the Lord, because this is the Lord, he knows it's the Lord. He says, my Lord, if I have now found favor in your sight. Do you know that if God visits us through the anointing, we found favor in his sight. If we found favor in his sight, don't rush quickly to ask for favor from God first, okay? You know, oh, God, say, oh, Lord, 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 do this for me, do that for me. No, we've got to host his presence first. He says, I found favor in your sight. Don't pass on by. Don't just quickly come and visit us and disappear and go quickly from here. Sit down. Let the little water be brought and wash your feet, rest yourself under the tree. On this, I want you to see similarities here with the washing of the feet and the bread. I'm not saying that this speaks about the communion of uh, John 13. But we'll see that in the Last Supper, the same thing happened. But now instead of the Lord's feet being, uh, I mean of washing the Lord's feet, 
in John 13, the Lord washed the feet of his disciples. Interesting, isn't it? Rest yourself. So we're not in a rush. When the presence of God comes, we're not in a rush. We want the Lord to say, Lord, let your glory rest upon us. Rest yourself, okay? And we will serve you. He will bring a morsel of bread. Uh, in that case, it's a visiting three persons. I'll bring you bread, water first to wash, and then sit down before you eat. Sit under the tree. I'll bring you a morsel of bread. Refresh your heart. Lord, let us refresh your heart with our worship. Let's refresh you with our praise. Then after that, you must pass by in as much as you have done to your servant. He didn't even ask the angel for the Lord for anything. He just said, Lord, I just want to minister to you. And if you, if you feel free to go, then you go. Then the Lord said, and they said, the three of them said, do as you have said. In other words, if you say that, do it. You know, often when we sing our songs of worship, Lord, we love you, we praise you, we join your presence. Ah, what time is it? Huh? It's getting late. Huh? <laughs> That's why we say, I'm not, I'm not saying that we are looking at that. I'm saying something. Why is this worship so long? Why is it? But if you, that's the presence of God, we don't look at the clock, we don't look, we refresh the Lord. Okay? So we do that. Huh? So you can see how what Ab Abraham did, right? Abraham, when the Lord said, do as you, as you have said, let's do as we have sung. If we say, Lord, we want to dwell in your presence, we want to receive your glory, receive your word, we want to hear you speak, don't rush off the next moment to do anything we like if the Lord visits. Now, I'm not saying every Sunday we've got to wait, 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 like some churches, huh? they're trying to uh, let the Lord visit them so they will sing in worship and they will wait until one and a half hours until sooner or later the church members begin to disappear from the church. <laughs> I know that church, there's a church here, all right? And nobody comes to the church because everybody is waiting for what? But if the presence of the Lord is here, we're not in a rush to leave, okay? See what happened, Abraham did. He ran in, hurried into a tent and to Sarah and said, quick, quick, quickly, make three measures of fine meal, knead it and bake cakes, make cakes. Then he ran to the herd and took a tender good calf. Take the best, make the best, all right? Serve God with the best, not like Malachi. You offer me the blind, the lame, and uh, we'll see if you offer to your governor, will he receive it? So do your best. Serve the Lord with the best. And the young man hastened to prepare. So then he took the bread, the butter, the milk, and the calf which he had prepared, set it before them, and Abraham stood by them under the tree as they ate. Why do you think he stood by them? You know what waiters do when they stand by you? Ready to serve whenever you have. That's a good restaurant, right? Then, uh, of course, they'll be very not obtrusive. They'll be somewhere nearby. So if you want something, you just have to maybe raise a hand and they're there. The attentiveness. You think, you think that's happening in today's churches? I think we, we see service, the presence of God in our midst as, uh, well, today things are not so exciting kind of thing. We, we have all kinds of reasons why we cannot find the presence of God. But then the word of God says that where two or three of us are, in, uh, are there, and God's presence is with us, is that the truth, if there's the truth, you should walk into this church, three or four persons, there are definitely more than that, with a fear of the Lord and a reverence from God that you're not going to be critical of people, of things, you're going to just say to the Lord, let your will be done. Now let's move on to the new covenant. Eh? Hosting the divine presence. How do we come in? Hebrews talked about a new and living way. The old covenant was that the high priest had to do all the sacrifices, let one goat go free, and then the other one sell out there, then put the blood on the horn of the altar and all kinds of things, and then the high priest himself goes in. The rest of the people are outside. But when Jesus died on the cross, this is what happened. Hebrews 10, verse 19 to 22. And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. Do you know, when we meet together, it doesn't mean that we now go to heaven's ho most holy place. But it tells us the presence of God is here, and today the most holy place is here. 
and it was made open to us because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and living, life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. You all know when he died on the cross, when he gave up his spirit, what happened? There was an earthquake. The veil that separated the holy of holies from outside was broken, speaking to us of now the access that you and I can enter into. And this is the house of God. This is, the t this is the place, this is the most holy place. We're coming by the blood of the Lamb, of Jesus. Not only that, because we have a great high priest who is today, who rules over God's house, not the pastor, it's the high priest who rules over God's house overall in the city as well as the world. Let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts. So there are a few ways of approaching the house of God. Is there sincerity inside you? Don't bluff yourself, okay? Don't bluff myself. If there's no sincerity, God sees it. Do you think that you will escape the scrutiny of God? Remember the story we did in uh, uh, Matthew? The king came into the banquet. He found somebody without the wedding gown. And they said, how did this fellow manage to get him? Take him out, throw him out into, into uh, uh, no, no, whatever. I forgot the word. Yes, we can come to the church but we still must wear the wedding garment. That wedding garment is a purity that comes from God. You must come with sincerity, not with wrong motives. Fully trusting Him. In other words, that Jesus has done everything necessary for us. That's why I can come boldly. So don't let your guilty conscience condemn you. If you have already confessed, even if you have the most wicked path, you must have confidence to come trusting Him. But the main thing is that it's a sincere heart. You have dealt with your sin, you have dealt with your life, and you know that it's all covered by the blood of Jesus. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Jesus talked about the washing of the water. It is not that you take a good bath and you come in, then you're pure, or even to the baptism of waters, because he says it's the word that washes us clean. The word that washes us. We'll look at that, right? So this is the New Testament way for the church. Huh? I want to bring up two things in John chapter 13 that's, like I said, similar to Abraham's visitation of the Lord. And I want us to see that in the things that God has, in the, in the sacraments that God has set for the church, the divine presence of God is there. We don't take it lightly. So I want you, first of all, to look with me at the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist. This coming Friday, I want the church, all of you, bring your uh, uh, connect group member, come. Because we're going to do the Lord's Supper, we're going to do the washing of feet, which are very key sacramental acts of Jesus that helps us recognize the presence of God in the people, amongst His people. Not just only in the worship, but in the sacraments of the church. Okay, now I'm going to bring you through some of the different denominations and how they see the Lord's Supper, or the Eucharist. Huh? And you see that whether you believe one or the other, the point I want to make is that we must have deep reverence for the bread and the cup. That's why we say to people who are not believers, don't partake of it. Whether you think it's a memorial or it's a transubstantiation or whatever it is, the body becoming uh, that, that you know, whatever, that is a great and deep reverence. Some of us in the charismatic churches have lost that reverence. And I, mean, I am glad that we're coming back again to bring in that reverence. So this Friday, come at 8 o'clock, we're going to have, instead of Wednesday prime meeting, we're going to have uh, the uh, washing of feet and the Lord's Supper together. And we'll share some verses, sing a couple of songs, and then we're going to allow the recognition of the presence of God in the people of God together. So what does the Roman Catholics believe? The Roman Catholic Church holds the doctrine of transubstantiation. According to this belief, during the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper, the bread and the wine literally transform into the actual body and blood of Christ. So when you eat of it, you're eating the actual body of Christ. The substance changes. It becomes the body and the blood of Christ while the appearance is still same. You see the wafer, it appears as a wafer, but now it is the body of Christ. 
That's what the Roman Catholics believe. They say the presence of Christ is permanent in the consecrated elements. But I don't think we go that extreme. Huh? That, uh, what about the Eastern Orthodox Church? That is the Byzantine side, the East and the West Roman Catholic Church. Huh? Eastern Orthodox Church also believes in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Now, the, there are many theologians and scholars in the Roman Catholic and uh, Eastern Orthodox churches. Some of the early fathers were from these traditions. So we should not lightly just ignore what they have discovered, right? So they use the term instead of transubstantiation, they read this metusiosis <laughs> to describe the transformation of the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. So they say the Eucharist is a mystery and a means of communion with God, the presence of God in the bread and the cup is literally the body of Christ, literally the blood of Jesus. And I take it from the part where Jesus said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part with me. And that's why many disciples left him at the time. So what is this? Why are you talking, we eat your flesh, drink your, eat your, uh, drink your blood, you know? And then Jesus said to the disciples, everybody is leaving me, will you also leave me? And the disciples said, where can we go? You have the word, uh, uh, word of life. Protestant denomination. Lutherans believe in the real presence of Christ's body and blood in the bread and wine. However, they want to reject the term of substantiation and they prefer what they call sacramental union. All right? in, the, in other words, through that sacrament that's been consecrated, we're actually eating the blood and, of Christ. Huh? Now, what about the next one? The Reformed Calvinists. These denominations emphasize the symbolic nature. Now, this is coming closer to us. Symbolic nature of the Lord's Supper. The bread and wine symbolizes Christ's sacrifice. There's no literal transformation. That's what we are looking at. We'll look at the Baptist evangelical very quickly. That's what we believe. That's, that it doesn't change the body and the blood. It's a symbol. Okay. So, I've heard one time some, somebody talked about this in some church about and did not know what he's talking about and say that it became the body of Christ. I think that's not understanding the position of evangelicals. What about the Baptists and evangelicals? Many Baptists and evangelicals view the Lord's Supper as a memorial. We remember his death and his resurrection. Symbolizes Christ's death and resurrection, but there's no real body and blood. The Methodist is slightly different from us. Huh? They believe that there's a real presence, but they're not like the Roman Catholic or Eastern Orthodox. They're more like the Reform. We, uh, it's just that when we eat it, and I think there's some real sense of meaning there, that there is a sense that grace and spiritual nourishment is received by us. So it's not just a memorial, it's more than that. I believe that you, you receive grace and spiritual nourishment. Well, the Anglican, Episcopalian, they are neither here nor there. Some church believe this, some church believe that. All right? So that's the view. Huh? I want to quickly take you to the washing of feet and hope to end by 11.30. Right? Say, thank you very much for taking the worship. If not, I would have no time to research, put all these things down. It would have been a quick thing and then we wouldn't have a deeper a depth of understanding. The washing of feet, yeah? okay? Now, John 13, that chapter, Jesus knew that it was time for him to go back to the Father, and he was having the last supper with them. And the scripture says he loved them till the end. Even Judas was going to betray him, he loved them till the end. We know how it goes, right? He started to wash the feet of the, uh, of the disciples one by one, and all of them were taken aback because this is countercultural. You know, it's the lowest people that wash the feet of the more important person. How can our Lord and Master wash my feet? And so well, they were all very, uh, what is happening? They were not. And when it came to Peter, <laughs> okay, this is what Peter said to him. You shall never wash my feet. <laughs> and then Jesus said to him, if I don't wash you, you have no part with me. It's a very interesting thing, you know. When, we, when Jesus commanded his disciples to wash the feet, he's saying that when we wash one another's feet, uh, we're creating a bond. We're becoming part 
of one another in the body of Christ. If you allow me to wash your feet, you're allowing me to be part of your life. And for me, allow you to wash my feet, you become part of my life. That's why in many churches, the ritual of washing feet has been going on for years. But again, ritual can become ritual with no meaning. But if we understand, that's why this Friday, if we do it, we will talk about it. We want to make sure that we do it not as a ritual, but understanding that there is a spiritual thing happening. When we wash your feet, you wash our feet, we are binding, we are, being, we are bound. And very interestingly, uh, after washing our feet, when they went on the supper, uh, then uh, uh, Jesus said, now every one of you clean, but not one, except for one. <laughs> and then John asked, uh, and he says, one of you will betray me. And John said, who is it? Me, me, me. And John said, the one to whom I give the bread. And when Judas took the bread, you know, Satan entered him. You see, when we wash each other's feet, there's a bond that prevents demonic spirits from coming in to affect our life with one another. And so he went out and betrayed Jesus. So, let's continue reading here. Eh? Simon Peter said to him, uh, the Lord said, if I don't wash you, have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Now, Simon is, is someone who always goes the extreme. Eh? He, he will, he, 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 but that's the kind of character God loves. He became a leader of the church. Because he loved God so much, he may not have a very good control with what he wants to say, but open his mouth and he says whatever he wants to say. And the Lord says, you don't have to go to the extreme. Wash your feet is enough. So we don't have to have a body washing ceremony today. Thank God. <laughs> Just wash the feet will do. He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet and is completely clean. He's talking of the washing of the water. Okay, we've been cleansed by the word. You are clean, but not all of you. And in our washing each other's feet, we're allowing the love of God to cleanse from our feet. The dirt that we pick up in life as we live, right? When we live in life, our foot picks up dirt, right? So you are cleansed by God, but there are little, little sins that we commit and we do that, you know, we're offended of, offenses against that if we watch one another god allows that as a means by which cleansing take place and you are clean completely but not all of you eh? then after washing their feet huh? sorry <laughs> i'm looking at the wrong thing after washing their feet he put on his robes again and sat down and asked do you understand what i was doing you call me teacher and Lord, and you are right because that's what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. So I hope it will be the first time when we do it, it will be a really meaningful thing we'll do, right? Not a ritual, but understanding what it means to, what it means to say we belong to the body of Christ. And in washing each other's feet, we're recognizing the presence of Christ in that person. We're recognizing we are hosting the divine presence in somebody else, okay? And he continues to say, I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. I tell you the truth, slaves are not greater than their master. Nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. Remember? They said to him, do as you have said. It's not what you say alone that's important. Nah? It's doing what you have said. That's why the Lord says, now you know these things, do it. You will be blessed in the doing of them. And then he goes on to this beautiful, beautiful commandment, new commandment. And, and that's what we do when we wash the feet of one another. We're obeying the commandment of Jesus. Says, I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I've loved you. You should love each other. You should also, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. So may we never go to uh, every Easter and do foot washing as a ritual. But recognizing its impact that we'll do it with sincerity, right? with sincerity of heart, having full trust in God, 
that's going to happen for us. I want to take it beyond and we'll finish yeah? the washing of feet for one another. I'll take you to Matthew continued yeah? when Jesus told this parable about recognizing his presence in the marginalized, in the poor. All right? Because this is what Jesus told. The parable, the story, you say, in the, in the day when he comes and the sheep and the goat were separated, the, uh, the sheep nation, goat nation, and welcoming the sheep nation in, uh, and they say, then the king will say to those on the right, come, you are blessed by my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. I was hungry, you fed me. I was thirsty, you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, you invited me into your home. I was naked, you gave me clothing. I was sick, you cared for me. I was in prison, and you visited me. And the people said, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry, feed you, or thirsty, and give you something? We didn't see Christ. I don't, uh, we were not around. That's what happened in the last days. We, we can't see Christ, okay? Or thirsty, give you some drink, or to a stranger and show you hospitality, or naked and give you clothing. When did we ever see you fig, sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth, when you did it to one of the least of my brothers and sisters, you were doing it for me. That's how we wash the feet of the world today and recognize the presence of God, the divine image in every person. It is in the loving of people that will bring about the blessings. So there are many things we could have talked about, but thank God, 11.30, we just finished just on time, and that's the next thing you have, a blank screen, all right? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Nah? I'm going to close in a word of prayer, and then we're going to have a great time fellowshipping together. Father, we thank you for your word. Your word always enlightens us. When it enlightens us, it gives us understanding. But you said, now that you know these things, go and do it. Well, Father, we do not, as a church, just look for emotional experiences. We seek for understanding your plans, your purposes, that we may be a church that do the things of God. We carry out the instruction of Jesus. We love one another. We wash one another's feet. We wash the feet of those that need help. We give them water. We give them drink. We serve them because in washing feet, we're serving people. Lord, may you bless us as a church that we will always fulfill the purposes of God. And thank you that every Sunday when we come together, we come with a sincere heart in good faith, trusting you with our guilty conscience washed and our bodies washed by the word of God. We come in boldly into the house of God. And when you visit us, we will take time to host your presence. Well, thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless each one of us and may the hand of the Lord be upon us this week.